for uh, taking your seat. Thanks. Recording in progress. Hmm? You mean for the final exam? Mm -hmm. Sounds good. <laughs> Big time. Mm -hmm. Did I take it and then? Mm -hmm. You want me to do the homework thing? Voice. No. Is it working? I don't. Okay. Hey, yo. Okay. I don't know. Yes. Okay. So, uh, I don't know. Like, at least up until this point in the last one hour, six people asked me about homeworks, grading, final exam, what is going on. So, um, so we all, all know, like, the, okay, we received the solutions to homework one, okay, on the Slack channel. You can all receive it. Um, you can compare, contrast, and so on. Homework two and final. So we are going to have the final on Friday, right? And we are going to submit the homework two solutions on Thursday. So it's a bit tight, right? But um, so here is some information about that. Homework two is going to include three questions. It's not going to be super hard. It's not going to be super easy. It's going it's to be like homework one. But um, it will be more familiar and more like, you know, conceptual and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to ask about full counting statistics. The reason that I did it in homework one is that serious to see what tools are being used and so on and so forth. Okay. But in the, in the final, um, there are going to be four questions. And just please, like, remember the times where I, like, pointed out something and told you that, oh, I'm not speaking as Gulja, but I'm speaking as your TA. You should know this with your heart. Because I'm going to ask questions about that. And expect questions similar to homeworks. One question only. It's going to be different. I think it might require some, like, craft and so on and so forth. But it's not going to be, like, the highest marked question. So you can feel comfortable with that. And you can interrupt me or like, and so on and so forth, me anytime. I don't know, 3 a.m. and you have a question. Just send me a message and I will reply, okay? So don't worry, it's, everything's gonna be great. So was there a question from the chat that I should respond uh, to? Yes, yeah. so there's a question in the chat. Uh, just to make sure I got, the, uh, I got the right interpretation, is the quantum measurement a particular way to open our system, as without it, the dynamics is purely Liouville? To open our system. We haven't gotten to anything about open systems explicitly yet. Yeah. It's, just a handy, it's just a handy formalization of what a measurement means, rather than talking about eigenstates and eigenvalues and things like that. Yeah. And so it's an alternative. The, the, yeah. the first set of slides hopefully conveyed the lesson that I'm talking in terms of quantum measurements, um, a quantum measurement operators is exactly the same as what people have already seen in terms of just uh, eigenvalues and eigenstates and the Born rule and so on, just um, uh, reformulated mathematically. Yeah. But uh, definitely, without the measurement, uh, the dynamics is Liouville. Um, without the measurement, the dynamics is a unitary, yeah. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. Ready for some more rock and roll. Um, let me see if I can get this thing out of my way. OK. So now, given all that, we're going back to this. Remember, um, this is what I presented at the very beginning of today's lecture. This is what Gilje went through in detail yesterday, where we have a system of interest, the bath. We're only paying attention at the end of the day to the system of interest. We don't get to see the bath. That's, in essence, the physical distinction between the two. And we have to worry about how the system of interest evolves. 
And in quantum mechanics, for us to be able to say anything interesting here, rather than just it's an overall unitary dynamics, we must talk about doing measurements that are only on the system of interest rather than the bath. Everything I've presented so far, the measurement operator, is just measurement on the state of the system. And here it's a joint system. So in the measurement, just taking what I've shown so far, would be something that's a measurement on the state of the system and the bath, or the system of interest, rather, and the bath. But we want to have a measurement that's only being applied to the system of interest, where you marginalize out over the bath. Well, how do we do that? And so this is a very, very crucial um, idea. It's what I call, you do it with what are called partial traces. So let's say that we have um, two um, systems, A and B, system of interest and bath, and their joint basis states are, um, uh, here's a tension product, um, AI cross BI. Okay, so AI is the states of, um, of uh, the first system and BI is the state of the second system. Okay? Because we're uncertain of their joint state, we also have a density operator, but it's a density operator over the joint states of the two systems. So it's row AB. It's not just going to be a row A and a row B. There's a row AB. But as I was just um, alluding to here, we want to say what happens if we measure just system A. OK? So the way you can do this, a convenient shorthand, keep um, hammering it. That's what all the density matrices are, is what are called partial traces. Basically, you do what the uh, name sounds like. You don't do a full trace over A and B, but you instead trace out just um, uh, system B. OK, rather than going through the actualization of what a partial trace is, it might be easiest to just work through an example. So if A and B are both spins, so they can both have two possible states, let's say that they are entangled. That's what this means right here, if you've encountered this um, in your undergraduate quantum, where the uh, joint density, um, uh, let's say that with probability um, uh, it can be 1 half, and either being uh, both spins are up, um, or uh, um, both spins are down, and um, that's actually got a product density matrix. Okay, so this is a pure state, and so if, uh, the way to confirm that is that the trace of rho squared equals one. But let's say that instead you have what's sometimes called a Bell state, so you can either both be up or both be down, with probably one half. This one is mixed. The, prob the uh, trace of uh, rho squared is equal to one half. Oh, it's not working again, damn it. Oh, come on, guys, this is not fun anymore. There we go. Okay, so we're gonna make the tensor product symbol implicit. Yeah, okay, good. So um, that was a uh, illustration so that's what um, partial traces, and this is an illustration of taking a full trace in the case of a, a joint density matrix. Um, you can also use density operators to define what's called the von Neumann entropy, and that is given by the trace of rho log rho. So you should have, um, uh, of course, in Shannon entropy, it's going to be sum over pi log pi, but this is um, uh, what turns out to be appropriate more generally when we have density matrices. And um, here is an example of um, uh, what, what some of the properties of the von Neumann entropy. If you're, in fact, if your density matrix is diagonal in a particular basis with entries pi, then it reduces to the Shannon classical entropy, as one might hope. If rho is a pure state, then the, um, uh, its uh, von Neumann entropy is actually um, equal to zero, just with classical entropy. And, base, and using this right here, the von Neumann entropy, you can define a lot of analogs of the uh, classical information theoretic uh, quantities. Um, for example, think about the relative entropy, the Kullback library divergence. If you remember the uh, standard definition of that um, uh, via Shannon and so on, it's sum over i of pi log qi divided by pi. We have no idea what that division might mean for density operators. But so instead, you rewrite it as a difference of two entropies. And, well, a difference of an entropy in a trace term, or cross entropy. And then you can use this to define the quantum mutual information. It's just going to be the um, relative entropy between a full joint matrix 
and the product of the two density matrices. Okay, so all of quantum computation and so on and so forth, these are very central um, concepts. Okay, so now let's return to the uh, case of uh, two spins, complete that example of uh, partial traces. Recall that the um, partial trace of a joint system is given by this formula up here. Let's consider the case where um, uh, this is row AB and it's a pure state. So therefore, its entropy is equal to zero. Then recall, we also had that right there. Um, the entropy in this case of rho A is equal to um, log two. It's a mixed state. So this is now something very, very funny. In classical physics, in classical Shannon entropy, the entropy of a subsystem is upper bounded by the entropy of a full system. So if I've got a joint system, um, a P sub IJ, the entropy of PI is upper bounded by the entropy of uh, PIJ. Quantum mechanically, that is not necessarily true. Here's a pure state, and so its entropy is zero. We now take its partial trace. We get down to this, so that's the analog of marginalizing, looking at only a subsystem. But now, the von Neumann entropy has gone up. That's a purely quantum mechanical phenomenon. OK, good. Now we're going to be talking about open quantum systems. I'm sort of spiraling around, getting closer and closer to this. Is everybody with me so far? I expect I'm starting to get into waters that fewer people have had the pleasure of swimming in before today. So let me know if I'm starting to go too fast. Um, OK, so we have a system of interest and um, what in quantum thermodynamics we call a bath, but what in uh, many other um, field, um, aspects of quantum uh, information processing is called the environment. And um, so just like um, we were doing yesterday with the Gurdje and so on and so forth, um, we're going to assume that the initial state is a product. So the initial joint density matrix is actually going to be a product of a density matrix over A, um, tensor product with a density matrix over B. OK? It turns out that in quantum mechanics, without loss of generality, all of the results will be the same if you actually take the density matrix for B to be a pure state in a larger state space. You can always play that trick in um, quantum mechanics. There's no real analog classically. It's called the purification theorem, if you want to look it up. Um, here, I'm just going to use it. I'm going to jump over the proof of the purification theorem and simply invoke it to say that sigma b is just going to be a pure state, b0, b0. OK, but the system of interest, um, that's, um, I'm going to write its density matrix that way. So combining, this is the density matrix of the full system. Question. OK, I have a question from the previous slide, where you compute the entropy of the pure state and the global state. I wish you know, since the entropy of CA is greater than the entropy of the global state, which interpretation will we have from those results? So, sorry, I didn't understand. I mean, the, the interpretation, because the entropy of the mixed state is greater than the entropy of the pure state. Um. I, I'm sorry, I'm not understanding. The, so it, because rho is diagonal in a basis with entries pi, if you'll notice, the basis 0, 0, 1, 1, rho is diagonal, you have a 1 half and a 1 half are the two probabilities. So um, uh, therefore, when you look at pi log pi, you're just going to get log 2. You're going to get 1 half log 2 plus 1 half okay, log what 2. What I'm asking is interpretation. Like physically, what's the meaning of the result? Oh, what is the meaning yes. of the result? It means that if you have an apparatus that can only look at the probabilities of the state of system A, and then you measure the probabilities of those and say, what's the entropy of the result of this measurement apparatus, you're going to get a log 2. If instead you've got an apparatus that can be looking at both A and B simultaneously and ask, what's the entropy of what I'm going to get there, 
Because that's a pure state, you're always going to get the exact same value, so you would get an entropy of zero. So think about it, I mean, what it, it's really just the normal um, EPR paradox kind of a thing. You have two spins that are separated that are entangled with one another. They're in a pure um, uh, joint state. So if I can measure the state of both of them, well, there's only one possible one, so I know that um, it's, it's got an entropy of zero. But if I can only measure the state of one of them, I don't know what it is. It's going to depend upon the state of the other one. So in that case, I get an entropy of log two. Okay. Hey, just a comment. Uh, I think this implies that conditional entropy uh, cannot really be defined in quantum mechanics in the sense it would be negative, right? Um, it can, let's see, um, it can be. I think it can be, yep. Okay, so um, anyway, moving right along, I'm going to probably, unfortunately, have to be moving relatively fast this end part. So there's a question on, uh, hence entropy is no longer extensive? Um, uh, we're not saying, um, so, okay, so extensive, is, is the way it's normally interpreted, it's an interesting question, the way it's normally interpreted is not due to partial traces, it's just due to expanding your system. And these results don't necessarily say if it's extensive or not. But in general, um, you could have entanglements that mean it would not be extensive. You, you could imagine that kind of a thing in general. But I haven't, in any sense, kind of proved that. We're going the other way, from the full system down, rather than actually building up to a bigger and bigger full system. Good question, good question. OK, so um, anyway, getting back to this open quantum system scenario, which is the uh, case of a finite bath in um, our perspective. Um, uh, we start where we've got a product of two density matrices. We're invoking some uh, voodoo, some uh, magic of quantum mechanics to say that without, log of, without loss of generality, even if in one particular basis it's a Gibbs um, density matrix, if I look in a bigger state space, I can view it as being in a single eigenstate of that state space. So um, without um, loss of generality, that's what we're invoking. So therefore, we're saying that the initial density matrix is given by this. The partial trace is, telling, is giving us what we would want, that it's actually sigma A, because we've got a product density matrix to start with. So it's sigma A, which is just the initial density matrix over system A. We now have unitary dynamics. So that's the analog of the Hamiltonian phase space preserving dynamics that uh, Gurdjie was presenting yesterday, unitary dynamics across some um, AB according to some unitary operator, which can be varying in time, like if the Hamiltonian is, is changing in time, U of t. So therefore, the density operator of just the system of interest, this you'll have to work through the algebra um, uh, later on. I'm afraid I've run out of time and I won't be able to um, go work through the linear algebra today. But if we're just looking at the density operator of the system of interest, so we're taking the partial trace, so we start with the um, uh, of, uh, row AB of zero, we hit it with a unitary operator. Remember several slides ago, we saw how to evolve a density matrix. And so that's what we're going to be doing here. And then we take a partial trace at the end. And so this is the actual, so you get this if you just work through the linear algebra. And then um, pulling that up here all together, um, if you uh, define the, um, uh, doing some more linear algebra here, if you define this, these operators E sub i k, um, there's one of these for every possible state of the environment. What you end up with is that the partial trace at a time a down to system, a time t down to system a is given by this sum these E's, which you're seeing here, and I'm sorry, as I said, I don't have time to qu quite work through the algebra, those are called Krauss operators or quantum operations. They are, this is the analog. Remember that if I just have a joint system, remember the formula for how you evolve the density matrix. Here we've got actually a very, very similar formula but because we've got this extra environment and we're doing the partial trace, 
we've actually got, a, in essence, a sum over these different u's rather than a single one. That's the effect of the coupling with the environment. And all details of that coupling with the environment, all details of the interaction Hamiltonian across the entire process, they're all buried in these E operators. That sum is over the states of the environment. OK? Let's see. Um, yeah, so here I'm pointing out the analogs that just like if we have a joint system, um, uh, here's how the uh, dynamics goes. You just have the unitary. Similarly here, we're having instead, in essence, a sum of these different um, cross operators are acting like the unitary does there. And just like um, uh, unitaries, um, uh, they are by definition their, um, their own inverses. Similarly, um, you have a similar condition with the Krauss operators. It just becomes a sum because there's multiple possible states of the environment. It started in one particular state, B0, but after the interaction, it can be in any one of its states in some particular eigenbasis, and each one of them, that's an index K. Okay? These maps with um, these uh, E sub Ks, each one of these, these are called completely um, positive. They're trace preserving. They preserve traces. They preserve norms. That's what this is saying right here. OK? Um, details of this in the book by Nielsen, um, which I don't know if I stole the PDF or if it's legitimate, but you can get it online one way or another. Um, in any case. Um, so now I'm going to try um, briefly to use everything that we just presented to derive an integral fluctuation theorem for quantum mechanical systems using this finite bath approach. Because that's, in essence, what I just worked through. I kept em emphasizing what they call in um, quantum information processing the environment. I'm just calling it the bath. OK? We have to be careful, though, about what measurements mean and how they occur. In the normal integral fluctuation theorems, um, if you recall in the Jarzinski version of the quote, the detail fluctuation theorem, we have all these different um, uh, Zs, different times, ZA and ZB, that you might be knowing the state of the system. In essence, we have to um, pay attention to what the analogs might be in quantum mechanics. And because with quantum mechanics, every time you do a measurement, you're hitting it with another one of these measurement operators, it's a very non-trivial thing. You can't just, like we did in the classical, implicitly in everything what Gilday presented yesterday, when you do a measurement, you're not changing the state of the system. But quantum mechanically, you do change the density matrix of the system when you do a measurement. So we have to be very much more careful about the kinds of measurements that we do. OK? So. This is what we just derived. So now we're going to modify all that just slightly to do quantum thermodynamics as so. We've got a Hamiltonian of the exact same form I had before. A Hamiltonian for the, the joint Hamiltonian, which is going to be determining the interaction between the density matrices of the um, system of interest in the bath. It's given by some of three uh, terms, one of them depends only in the system of interest, one only in the bath, and then the last one is an interaction Hamiltonian. And for simplicity, I'm looking at the case of a single um, uh, bath, as I mentioned at the beginning of today. So rather than invoking the purification theorem, just like in uh, Jarzinski's derivation of the detail fluctuation theorem, we're going to be saying that the initial um, density matrix of the bath is a Gibbs, according to the um, Hamiltonian of just the bath. OK, that's like the Boltzmann distribution that we were seeing yesterday. Just like with yesterday, and just like in the quantum information processing, we're going to have the initial distribution be a um, product. Sorry, the initial density matrix be a product of density matrices. And again, the analog of the Hamiltonian dynamics is going to be unitary dynamics. According to a unitary operator, I'm just going to have time go from 0 to 1. OK? And now we're going to be, there's many, many different ways to get the fluctuation theorems in quantum mechanics. It's still ongoing research, frankly, a controversial issue. 
I'm just going to be showing what's called the two-time measurement approach, where we're actually going to be having a measurement operator that looks at the state of the system at two separate times, at t equals 0 and at t equals 1. It's going to, so to speak, simultaneously be looking at both. Sorry, David. So, so you are assuming that the interaction at time 0 is 0? Um, well, there is. It, or, it does, that's that's what when you start. That's the initial condition. Sorry? That's the initial condition, is that they are independent. Yes. So, t so equals zero. If uh, the interaction is non-zero, that, that is a non-equilibrium state, right? Um, oh, this is whole thing is, yeah, there's, there's no notion of equilibrium here. Oh, OK. Because there's no infinite external bath. Um, okay. You could imagine these things getting to a stationary state when the density matrix isn't changing. And you can then imagine doing things like worrying about whether there's probability current flowing in just the system of interest. But the joint system is always going to be um, evolving according to a unitary. Yeah. The system of interest can be doing funky things, like getting to what you might want to call an um, equilibrium. But the joint system is always just evolving according to a unitary. So it's always invertible dynamics. So actually, I think that means that you cannot have even a stationary density matrix of the joint unless it's always going to be starts for that way. OK, you can't have converging. Because the unitary dynamics is invertible, you can't have two different initial um, density matrices that, that go to the same ending one. No? Um, not in a closed system. That's what a unitary. Uh -huh. Unitary dynamics, it's invertible. Just like Hamiltonian, just like, in, just like yesterday, the joint system of interest and Bath and Chris Straczynski's um, set up, um, you can, can't have anything like a stationary state that's, that things evolve to unless you start in that stationary state because the dynamics is invertible. And if I am going to the same ending state, dynamics is invertible, I can't figure out where I would come from. So everything can always be distinguished. OK? All right, away we go. This is going to be strange. Um, it's going to take hours and hours, um, not necessarily before your final exam, but at some point when you want to really start to grapple with what's going on in quantum um, mechanics in general, but certainly in quantum thermodynamics, to, to fully understand these weird kind of prestidigitation is the word, the weird kind of magic that I will be um, performing right now um, to actually get these quantum integral fluctuation theorems, OK? Away we go. As I mentioned, we're going to have two measurements, at t equals 0 and t equals 1. The measurement operator at t equals 0, it's a projection um, onto the joint state at that particular time, because we know we're in a Gibbs state, where the xa0, it diagonalizes um, uh, the initial um, density matrix of the system of interest, and where the, um, uh, the Gibbs states, they diagonalize the Hamiltonian of the bath, and therefore they diagonalize the Gibbs, um, the Gibbs density matrix of the bath. OK? I'm just stipulating this at, um, at this particular point. This is almost um, a mathematical tricks that will result in an actual physical prediction. But at this point, they're mathematical tricks. OK, then at t equals 1, um, uh, we're going to be still be using the exact same uh, um, basis for the um, uh, bath, for the environment. Recall that, it's in, that the Hamiltonian of the bath doesn't change with time, whereas the Hamiltonian of the system of interest can. So we know it's going to be diagonalized by the exact same basis at the end as it was at the beginning. Um, but because the um, state of the, um, because the density matrix of the system of interest is changing, I'm going to be using a uh, basis for time one that diagonalizes its ending density matrix. So this is very, very funky. I'm actually going to be using two measurements where the, um, uh, where the measurements, the actual physical process collapsing the wave packet, so to speak, at t equals 1, is going to be a function of the particular unitary. This means that if I'm going to be doing my experimental apparatus, and I'm measuring it at t equals 0 and t equals 1, I'm going to be making sure that the measurement I make at t equals 1 
varies depending on some properties of the actual underlying dynamics of the process. It's not like I've got a fixed measurement that I'm applying to find out something about the process. I'm having to exploit information about the process to actually even define what that measurement of t equals 1 is. This is very strange kind of stuff. Um, and th this is not my own work. This is actually, believe it or not, standard in the literature. But I just want to be um, using this to show you how we can get the integral fluctuation theorems. OK? So just be warned. Oh, yeah, this is now, let's see, well, there we go. OK. Um, uh, yes, so I just uh, emphasized that point right there. All right, so here's the Hamiltonian. As I mentioned, the um, Hamiltonian of the uh, bath is not changing in time, whereas the Hamiltonian of the system of interest, we allow it to. And so the two-time measurement, um, uh, because it provides us these values here, those are what are coming out of these uh, measurements at these two times, that means we have all these values down here. We have xA of 0, um, xA of 1, and xB of 0, and xB of 1. Question? Yeah. Okay. So I'm thinking everything in terms of the classical correspondences, OK? So, and the, in terms of the accessible and inaccessible degrees of freedom. So, OK, the question is, I understand the first, OK, there are four, like, this is a, yeah, quote, ripple of, like, this measurements. I understand the first three ones. So xA0, xA1, xB0. I don't understand the xB1 because I, I just thought that, oh, these are inaccessible. Because it's the, it's the exact same thing. No, um, I, I understand it mathematically. I just thought that we don't care about it. It's inaccessible the, degrees of freedom. That will be coming out when we look to the partial traces to get how the um, entropy of just the system is changing. OK. You are correct. This is a weird thing. The measurement is going over both A and B. Uh huh. But we are, at the end of the day, only going to be looking at the entropy of um, system A, and we're going to be looking at the expected energy of system B. Wow. Okay. Yeah, but, but notice that in the actual classical physics, there's not even a notion of the measurement. That's right. There's an accessible and inaccessible, which you and not, nobody else here knows what that means. But that's oh, got to we do. We talked about it yesterday. Okay, mm -hmm. that's got to do with the reinitialization and so on. But there's no, there's nothing saying when we do the measurements. We're not, there's not something saying what a measurement even is. Okay, because the one thing that actually sort of seemed peculiar to me about XB one measurement is that I understand, for example, this integrating out the contribution from the bath, this inaccessible degrees of freedom in the classical one. But now, how do you sort of like? Because we have a probability distribution over it once we do the measurements. The measurement okay. is how we reduce things to classical physics, mm -hmm. where we can actually now look at things like expected values of the Hamiltonian. OK. 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 All right? OK. OK, so we have a question in the chat just to make sure. That, so the measurement is done on system of interest. Uh, how are you getting probabilities for the BAT? So we, where is no, the measurement, as Gilja was just emphasizing, yeah. It's actually done on both systems. Yeah, exactly. And exactly. so at time equals zero, the measurement is yeah. in the, remember, the measurement we're using projection operator measurements. And at time equals zero, the projection operator measurements are defined by, um, uh, in this basis, xA zero, because that's what diagonalizes sigma A, and xB Gibbs, because that diagonalizes um, uh, the density matrix of system B. The, diagonal, the um, exact same basis um, diagonalizes system B at t equals 1 because its Hamiltonian is not changing. So if you, di if you diagonalize its Hamiltonian, therefore you're diagonalizing its Gibbs state. Um, and but, all, but because system A, its Hamiltonian is changing, therefore um, what we're doing is we're using a different uh, measurement operator, different projections um, uh, we're using uh, to actually measure its state at time one. The crucial thing is that what's coming out of this is these four values. We know xA and xB both at time zero and, and, um, as, and at time one. OK? OK, so there is another question which I think, uh, well, then after measurement system of interest and BAT collapse, 
then both system of interest and BAT evolve again? Um, no, this is, well, um, you'll see. Let me go a few okay. more slides and, and the person will see. But, but yes, there's a unitary between t equals zero and t equals one. That's correct. Okay? But the crucial thing is that because we have these four values, we also know these four values. We know the probability of system A at time equals zero and its probability at time equals one of it being in particular states. We can get those. You see, what we can do is we can do the partial traces to get these probability distributions, and now we know what the actual values are that we are evaluating them at based upon this measurement. This measurement is playing the exact same role of getting down to trajectory level quantities in classical physics. We've got the distribution by just doing the partial traces. That's just like in classical physics, and we're evaluating that distribution at a particular point, just like in the trajectory um, uh, level formulation of um, well, the trajectory level analysis behind the detail fluctuation theorems. Remember that everything there the probability distribution over things like entropy production is the distribution over different trajectories. And it's all based upon things like the trajectory level entropy, which is just was log pi. So we had some particular distribution um, p over the system of interest. And we were evaluating it at one particular point, depending on which trajectory we're on. Here, it's a similar thing. The trajectory we're on <coughs> is instead, in a quantum mechanical scenario, being replaced by the values of these measurements. So those can be viewed as the specification of the trajectory, so to speak. And they are what's coming out of the measurements. So these values are coming out of the two time measurements. They're the analog of the trajectory. And we're going to be feeding them into probability distributions, which are just like the probability distributions we were seeing yesterday. OK? So um, as I say, we've now got the probabilities of system A um, at the beginning and the end. And we also have the Hamiltonians of system B at the beginning and the end. OK, so um, uh, as the person mentioned on the chat, we've got the unitary dynamics. We've got all these definitions of what these different basis states are. Two time measurements are giving us what we want. So the heat flow, just like yesterday, is going to be for this particular trajectory, for this particular set of four measurements, it's going to be HB of XB1 um, minus um, HB of XB0. And the typo. And sorry, where's the typo? The third formula. It's not important. Uh, for the delta Q? No, delta SA minus delta Q. You repeat Yo, it. Um, isn't it, am I, am I, what is going on? Oh, yeah, 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 that should be a, that's a one rather than a zero. Yep, yep, typo, exactly as Guru just said. This should be um, a log of P1 of uh, X1 of, one, of XA of one minus the uh, same thing at zero. Okay, so we've now defined what the um, EP is for the analog of a trajectory, quantum mechanically, by using a measurement operator which is something that was only kind of implicit at most when we were doing things in classical statistical physics formulation. OK? This should be somewhat confusing, because it's frankly a little bit, no. eh, but. Not, sorry, there is a comment on Zoom, but yeah, sorry about that. I'm sorry, I didn't oh. say no, <laughs> yeah. because it's not true, but yeah. OK. Um, so this uh, should be a little bit funky, um, but uh, nonetheless, um, uh, you should be able to follow the math when you sit down and go through the algebra um, a little bit later on. OK? Is everybody comfortable enough that I continue, or should I um, uh, review, go back over some points? Silence is assent. So, okay. Well, uh, maybe so. Probably there is a little bit of uh, uh, confusion uh, on what X A and, and X B mean because uh, so they are operators. They are the operators. No, no, they are the values of the measurements. 
They are the values of the measurement, but then yes, so the measurement uh, you are also using it uh, uh, as uh, coordinates of system. And a, these are the coordinates that, that come out. Those are the values that come out. Okay. Okay. So a measurement is always going to give you a random value. Okay. The Born rule and so on. And we're just saying that we're doing measurements at, this is a mathematical thing, we're doing measurements at t equals 0 and mm -hmm. t equals 1 of the joint system. This is how we're defining trajectory. It's just like in the classical case where the trajectories were trajectories of the joint system. And then we saw what the implications of the distribution over trajectories of the joint system was for how the entropy production of the system of interest changes. Here, the analog of those trajectories over the joint system is, um, uh, so you can have different trajectories over the joint system. Here, you can have different quadruples of the initial and ending values of the measurements of the joint measurements of the states of the system and of the environment. Okay. Okay? okay? So it's basically taking the classical physics um, quantities and thinking about what they would mean in a quantum mechanical formulation. Actually, there is a comment of, yeah. I mean, I tried to reply, but maybe, yeah. I tried to reply, but maybe you should respond. It doesn't make sense that we are also making measurements of the bath, because I'm, I'm not saying this. <laughs> We're just translating. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So like, it doesn't make sense to make measurements, because bath always um, evolves independent of the SOI. But that's not true, that's right? Not true. Because interaction and Hamiltonian also affects the Yeah, yeah, bath. yeah. Look right here. Yeah. So that's the whole point. If the bath were evolving independent of the SOI, there would be nothing to be done. But he also raised another point that I was thinking about five minutes ago. Then you convinced me, like 75%, so I didn't say anything. But yeah, I think this, um, for example, when you come from a classical point of view, when you think in terms of defining the bath as a composition of degrees of freedom that are inaccessible to you, then it really doesn't make sense, as Colin said, to make like measurements on the bath from that perspective. The measurements are just like um, in the uh, classical formulation we can look at trajectories of the joint system of interest and the bath. We're only going, at the end of the day, be, as engineers, be able to access the system of interest thermodynamically. But to derive the IFTs, it's a mathematics to actually derive the fluctuation theorems. And yesterday, we were saying, well, we've got a trajectory, the sum trajectory over the system of interest and the bath, some joint trajectory. And there it is, and that didn't bother us at all. And here, when we're translating that into quantum mechanics, simply saying, well, that joint trajectory is instead this um, pair of this, uh, set of this quadruple of values. So it's kind of related to that Zen tree falling in the forest business. That just because we do, the, because the, the measurement is almost like a mathematical convenience. It's a way for us to be able to say, what is the joint trajectory of the system? Because at the end of the day, we're still only interested in um, uh, what we're going to be calling the entropy production, which is the change in the entropy of the system of interest minus the um, change of the expected Hamiltonian of the bath by itself. That's the quantity that the engineer can actually access. We are going to be um, figuring out the distribution properties of the distribution over that delta s by considering trajectories, which in this domain is actually quadruples of these measurement values. Nobody should be comfortable. If you're comfortable, then you're, it's kind of like um, uh, there's a cliche that if you think you know what probability means, you don't. If you're comfortable right now, then you're not understanding. Yeah, I'm uncomfortable, like very much. Good. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, exactly. The one thing that comforts me is try to not go from yesterday to today, like classical to quantum, but to reverse from today to yesterday, from quantum to classical. You could do that as well. Yeah. yeah. Because yep. this, this realm is always more, you know, comprehensive. So. Yeah. So we're not playing favorites when we define the measurement process, yeah. which is defining trajectories. We're only playing favorites when we then actually say, what is entropy production? But measurements were agnostic between the system of interest and the bath. Just like we are, we, we have no problem talking about a joint trajectory 
in classical dynamics where at the end of the day, you're only going to be looking at the marginal distribution of that down to a system of interest, you can still define the dynamics of a joint probability distribution over the system of interest and other things. Um, but Okay, I just want to remind you of something. Um, right now, we are doing finite math, Hamiltonian formalism. And one of the things that followed from yesterday was the emphasis on the fact that um, following your command, we don't right now consider bats as like this idealized huge infinite reservoirs, Correct. but we are considering them as like finite quantum systems. So we don't make any kind of like this underlying assumptions in, as in your command or as in the infinite bat formalism. No, no, this is... Uh that you should feel, whoever the questioner is, you should feel uncomfortable because that's what I was emphasizing from the beginning. All of today, just like yesterday, is about a finite bath. Nothing infinite. And, yeah, it wouldn't make sense to talk about like this, this kind of measurements. Yeah, okay, between... yep. so, so uh, let me go on now. Sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, so um, let's see. Okay, so we've got the value of the EP from the two-time measurement. And um, then the, uh, so notice though, that this requires us to know those probability distributions, which are the same probability distributions that we assumed that we knew before. These are the probability distributions being evaluated at this quadruple of values, which we got out of our measurement, out of our two-time measurement. The probability values, the probability distribution we get by um, uh, just doing the traces in the normal way. So this is the EP on a trajectory, and the joint probability distribution is given by, this is basically Bayes' rule, the joint distribution at time zero times the, the probability at time one condition on the uh, state at time zero. This first one we know is going to be the distribution over states of the system times a Gibbs distribution over the states of the bath. And the second one is just going to be given by the fact that we've got this underlying unitary over the joint space that's evolving the initial state. So you've got, this is the initial state. You hit it with the unitary to get you up to state one. And then you uh, take the projection with these values um, of the joint state at time one. And this is just applying Bayes' rule to give you the joint distribution over those values of the quadruple. Okay. Unfortunately, the fonts didn't, I don't think they came out quite clean, but the important point is to notice there's a conditioning bar right here. This first line is just Bayes' rule. It's got nothing to do with physics, with quantum mechanics. The quantum mechanics is coming in down there. Okay. Everybody good with that? So if we, um, now here's the actual um, definition of the reverse process. Question. Sorry? A uh, yes. Yeah, there's the same typo. If that's the question, there's the same typographic error. OK, yep. OK? All right, so we now have to define the reverse process. And we do that essentially the same way that Gurdjieff was talking about Chris doing it yesterday, or that she was yesterday talking about how Chris did it. Um, we start, I'm um, in the reverse process, we start with the system in its ending state after the forward process with this probability distribution which is given by the forward process. We evolve according to the time reversal of the unitary. I'm not going to talk today about what it means to have a time reversal operator in quantum physics, it's an anti-unitary operator. Um, and you have, to, you have to know about a little bit of what's called Wigner's theorem to understand it. At this point, just sort of take my word for it. Um, and then um, uh, what you're going to have is if you had a forward trajectory that went from that initial state to uh, that final state, we're going to say that the probability distribution of uh, the reverse one, the conditional one, is going to be given by um, what you do all this for that definition, for the fact that you're going backwards with the anti-unitary, 
Basically, if you look at the joint distribution going forward divided by the joint distribution going backward, you're just going to be getting the uh, ratio. Why did that not fix? Um, those A's and B's should have all been lower cases. My apologies. I'm not quite sure why that didn't happen. You're just going to be getting the uh, ratio of uh, the uh, Boltzmann terms, the Boltzmann distribution terms, which are the Hamiltonians, and of the logs of the initial of the initial state and the final state. Okay, I think I'm tripping, but do, it's the this asterisk is in the numerator or the denominator. Um, here it's actually in the numerator. Okay. Because it's not, this is not a negative EP. It would be e to the negative EP if you were to flip it around. This is just e to the EP. OK. OK, and I've, as I say, I've got more typos here. My apologies. And then we're almost to the end. Once we're given this, recall that in um, what Gilje presented yesterday, there was the exact same thing. There was an e to the EP term that came out that was purely due to the fact that the reverse process you are starting at a state that is given by the forward process, but you're evaluating it under a Gibbs distribution, um, uh, of a, which is the beginning one of the reverse process. OK, so um, why did that not come out? Anyway, so uh, plugging that formula in, um, uh, what we're going to be getting here is just the integral fluctuation theorem. If we then just take this, multiply through both sides um, uh, to get the probability of uh, the EP. So I take the logarithm and multiply both sides through by the, uh, probably the EP. Just in the usual way of going from a DFT to a um, IFT, we get a um, uh, conventional integral fluctuation theorem. So the crucial thing is that this very, very weird reverse process, which is the P star, that actually doesn't occur. So DFTs always generically have this reverse process probability in the denominator. That is not going to be meaningful unless you do an experiment where you run this reverse process. If you're only interested in the forward process, you can't be using a DFT. You've got to actually instead convert it to an IFT, which involves integrating out over all possible outcomes of the reverse process so that you're only considering the outcomes of the forward process and in IFTs, this EP always refers just to the forward process. OK, so I apologize. There was a lot there at the end. Um, if there had been, if this were a three-week course rather than a two-week course, I would have let this push on into um, tomorrow's lectures to go over this a little bit more carefully. But the details are there in all the slides. I'll be posting them to the Slack channel very soon. And this way, we'll be able to tomorrow get into doing a little bit of computer science. But the important point for today was that you can take everything that um, Chris Jarzinski did as channeled through Gilja yesterday for a classical domain. And when you just use standard quantum information processing with partial traces on density operators rather than marginalizations on probability distributions, you can do essentially the same kind of a thing where you've got to have this weird two time measurement which is the analog of knowing what the trajectory is. And you can derive an integral fluctuation theorem, which has to do with the EP, which is change of the von Neumann entropy of the state of the system of interest, subtracting from that the, expected, the change in the expected energy of the actual bath. Same stuff goes through. OK? Any remaining questions? People should be moderately confused. If you're completely confused, please ask questions. If you think you know it all, well, there's one of two possibilities. Either you do, low probability, but possible, or no, that actually means that you don't understand. OK? Uh, uh, yeah, and what's it asking? I don't see it. Um, I'm not sure what the question is. OK, so this is one of the advantages of using the measurement operator formalism rather than talking in terms of a, 
This is one of the advantages of using a measurement operator formalism rather than talking in terms of an operator with eigenvalues and eigenstates and you project down to one of those eigenstates. You can define two time measurements. We don't have to say what they are physically. At the end of the day, we were only using this as a mathematical process to derive that formula. And one way to think about this um, uh, experimentally is that you have one person can measure the state of a system at the beginning, somebody else can be measuring it at the end, so there, and there's no um, transfer of information between them, uh, and then this, that's going to be defining your quadruple, and then we can have a third person who looks at what are the values of the EP that come out of it. You can be more careful about this. You can show that's consistent with the first law of thermodynamics, that this EP is actually dissipated work that cannot be recovered, but that's one way to think about it. This is all, um, uh, this is all done in the two-time measurement stuff. There is a paper that um, I think we, was sent around by um, Ueda, Funo, Sagawa, and some others came out a couple of years ago on um, quantum integral fluctuation theorems, the two-time measurement approach. So it's done in that particular paper. And also, actually, Edgar, well done, with, uh, actually, no, Gonzalo, not Edgar, yeah. has uh, done things related to this. OK? So as I say, I'll post these soon. I would also look at Nielsen and this other paper by uh, Ueda et Alia. I'll post these after fixing the typos. Can I just logistical? Mm -hmm. Logistical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> OK. Um, so this is the you know foundations of our reality and so on and so forth but we are not going to have it in our homeworks okay <laughs> this is just yeah i just wanted to t tell you this but know how to turn traces into sums know it with your heart that's it but can you talk about um tomorrow's lecture and the other day yeah so yeah that yeah good point yes so other, some people have been asking about this so um, as you've probably noticed, the first time this um, course being given it and so on and so forth, that we haven't um, necessarily timed things out so we'll be able to spend as much time on the computer science part of it as would have been ideal. Tomorrow, though, um, we're going to jump into that. So to begin with, Gilja will be presenting um, what's the simplest computational machine in the Chomsky hierarchy, though there are other ones that people um, uh, consider in computer science. And those are called deterministic finite automata, and maybe also to probabilistic mm -hmm. finite automata. I'm presenting some of the computer science theory. You've probably heard about questions like, does P equals MP? That involves Turing machines. The analogous questions for deterministic finite automata have actually all been answered. And for that reason, actually, computer scientists don't find them as interesting these days anymore compared to Turing machines. But for our purposes, where we're just trying to figure out the stochastic thermodynamics of computer science problems, systems, that makes them actually ideal because all the computer science issues, or a lot of the computer science issues, have already been figured out. Then um, uh, tomorrow afternoon, I'll start to um, present some stuff on Turing machines. Algorithmic information theory, the most profound philosophy that humanity has actually established to date. The only philosophy, I would say, which is, in its own way, reflects the lessons of Everett, which it says, screw you humans, what you think actually truth is. Here are some proofs. Screws up with your notion of what reality really is? Good. You change. Reality won't. Anyway, getting off the soapbox and the philosophizing. That's Turing machines and algorithmic information theory. That'll be the second half of tomorrow and then the beginning of the last day, Thursday. And then hopefully, time allowing, um, by the end of Thursday, I'll um, show a little bit about some work going on now for um, applying stochastic thermodynamics to computational machines, which are actually formalized in terms of finite baths. So to give you a very, very quick idea, the system of interest is going to be your um, computational machine. The set of inputs it gets is going to be generated by the bath. OK? And then the hazing ritual, aka um, exam, is on Friday. OK, 
Can I hype people? Can Am you? I allowed to hype people, like to excite them? If you're interested in computational complexity, building up all of these on all, all of these things, Thursday, I think um, one of the things that David will present, um, I think it's fair to say that it's like the first time that um, you know you will have a, you will see a result in stochastic thermodynamics or in any of thermodynamics actually that can be related to computational complexity in computer science terms. So like. If you want to witness a first in history, yeah, you will like Thursday. <laughs> okay, this was just for hyping, okay, but it's I, true. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't know if I'll be able to actually get to that particular result, hopefully. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. All right, thanks, everybody.